Hi everyone, welcome to the System Fusion Forum. This is the, the sixth System Fusion Forum. The first one we did was on a Sunday morning in 2015 in the old Hera Arena and they couldn't squeeze us in because it was a new forum and well you can have it on Sunday morning and I thought who's going to show up on Sunday morning? We had 200 people show up for the first Fusion Forum in 2015. So it's good to see everybody here at the end of the day. Uh, this is the only fusion, just the only digital voice forum focused on ham radio here at the Hamvention. There are no other ones this year, so glad to see everybody. I know several, many of you I know, some I don't. Um, as John mentioned earlier, if you're interested in asking a question, write it on the front and guess on the back what the trivia question is. I'm not sure what the prize is, but I'm sure it'll be stu stupendous. Um, I also, since I'm the forum moderator, I get special dispensation, so I'm going to hand out to all of you flyers to the Digital Communication Conference. It's going to be in Charlotte this year, so if you can make it down to Charlotte in mid-September, so I'll hand those flyers out too. I'll take a little extra license and do, and do that. That has nothing to do with the forum. Um, we expect it's going to be a, a good forum this year. John here is the, is the uh, manager of sales for Yesu USA Amateur Radio. He's been with Yesu since 2015. 2017. 2017. Gee, it seems longer. So it's been five years. John has been with the AC for five years. And, um, you know, sales manager really does a disservice. He's not just a salesman. John is very technically competent and he experiments with all kinds of tech, digital technologies and communication technologies. He's got prior experience. So, uh, you know, he's very, very knowledgeable. You probably have seen a lot of the YouTube videos he's done. Yesu has an extensive social media uh, presence on Facebook and YouTube. John will talk about that. One other shameless plug, um, I'm also the moderator, the founder and moderator of the System Fusion Groups IO group. It used to be a Yahoo group. We got about 3,000 members on the group. So if you want to join another forum in addition to what Yesu provides, there is the System Fusion, all one word, Groups IO group that you can join. And I'm the moderator of that. So without further ado, um, I'm going to hand it over to John. If you raise your hand, me and one of my compatriots here from Yesu. I'm not a Yesu employee, I just helped them out, but one of our fellow Yesu employees will have cards and we can give you a card, and then we'll collect it afterwards and get those questions answered. So, without further ado, here is John Crook and then UPC from Yesu. All righty. Good. What time is it? Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, hopefully, my computer won't die on me here. I think we'll be okay but just in case. So as we said, we're handing out cards. If you have a question uh, that you want asked, go ahead and um, get a card. We, um, I've had some uh, questions that people who were unable to attend Hamvention 2022 here, they've already sent that to me. I'll go ahead and um, answer some of the preliminary questions, which is, no, the stuff that comes out of my mouth does not help mushrooms grow. Um, and I figured the proper way to do, because some of the other questions were unique and some of the questions were good. And so we figured that this year we would ask and allow people to ask questions because there's a lot of growth in Fusion. And I think this year's presentation, you'll see the title and you'll understand why. But before that, if you want to take advantage of the trivia question, what year was Yezu System Fusion introduced to the public? So write that on the back side. And by the way, write your call sign, your name, or something like that so we know who you are. Then you can't give them a hint. No, 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 because they're going to know. No, it's an easy hint. Uh, Let me give them one hint. Give them one hint. All right. <laughs> it was in Seattle. There's so many ways I can go with that one. All right, but what do you win? Well, you win an oven mitt. No, okay. Um, what you do is if you are one of the three who are correct, and we will randomly pick the cards there, you get to win a Yezu bag. You get to win a mouse pad. You get to win a log book. And the thing that has been most sought after, the coveted Yezu mug. Oh. And I'll be selling them for $89.95 afterwards, too. Uh, Got to pay for my salary somehow. So that's, that's what you can win if your question is right. All right, so once again, what year was Yezu System Fusion introduced to the public? Without further ado, let me switch a few things around here. And we're going to get the presentation started.
How's everybody doing today, though, otherwise? Been good so far? Warm. We good to be back? Yeah, it's warm, I know. I'm from Wisconsin. Anything above 64 is a nightmare. Huh? That's wisdom. Does that work? Is that a good one? Okay. All righty. All righty, so the Yezu System Fusion form, once everything comes back online here. Anyone? All righty. So I figured this was the most appropriate title. Yezu System Fusion. The myth, the legend, the lies. So there was a time when everything was good and we came out with a product and that product was called the Asia System Fusion. And what it did was it required us to have three core principles. Anybody remember what those are? Okay, do I have to run into the audience here? Or what? Come on, participation, come on. What was one of the three principles that Fusion had to do? Is that good? Correct. So high quality digital voice, ease of use and operation, and flexibility, okay? And Fusion has maintained that. And over the years, what we started to find out with Fusion was it really was something that people wanted to do because it was easy, because it was fun. But what happened was is when we introduced Fusion, we started to see that it started to go in different places. And one of the places that it went was really a lot of input from all of you. And that helped out a lot because we got to see from Yezu where you wanted to go, what you wanted it to do. And there were other, there were minor things. Like, does anybody know why we put the beep at the end of the transmission? So on your radio, when you hear someone done talking in Fusion, it beeps. You know why we put it in there? Because everybody requested it. Initially, when Fusion first came out, if you were an early adopter, when someone was done talking, you wouldn't know they were done talking. There was no beep. Then everybody said, hey, can you put a beep in it so I know when people are done talking? Yeah, sure. What the heck, right? And then we went along and we received other certain things. A lot, believe it or not, a lot of features that people have wanted and we've had in radios that have come out recently, such as FT3, FT5, FTM200, FTM300, were things that people said, we would like to see this in there. We would like to see this in there. If you start and look back at Fusion from the concepts of what it is, it's actually changed a lot. Radios could not store the mode of operation. They couldn't store the DGID. They couldn't do a lot of these things, okay? Back actually, how many people had Fusion when it first came out? Okay, so the few that have raised their hands, we never had DGID. If you have a Fusion radio now, DGID is something that actually came back with the second version of Fusion. Because what people wanted to do is they said, I wanted something that would be able to work with Fusion, so kind of like working like a CTCSS or DCS tone, and that's where DGID came from. But what happened was is that we started to see a lot of this stuff on there, and we started to see that there was a lot of jealousy. Because, and I'll tell you this, they probably won't like it that I say this, but guess what? There's probably never gonna be one digital voice. As much as everybody would like a digital, one digital voice, there's not gonna be. Okay? Just like there's no one digital data on there. How many people do FT8? Okay, this is gonna be a right twix, left twix thing. How many people hate FT8? It's okay, you can raise your hands. We're all friends here, okay? But see, that's the thing. People are gonna like Fusion, people are not gonna like Fusion. But it's another option, it's another tool in the toolbox that we can use for per se, per se of a term. But the reason we call today the myth, the legend, and the lies is because, guess what? There's a lot of myths out there. There's a lot of legends, and there's a lot of lies. So let's start out with the answer, which was 2013. 2013, who got that right? Okay, everybody that has a card should have raised their hands. Okay, 2013. Now, why did Mark say, did you say Seattle? It was Seattle? I thought it was Arizona. So it was at Tapper, correct? Yeah, the Tapper Digital Communication Conference is the handing of flyers out about. So in 2013, at the Digital Communication Conference, the same as the flyers I'm handing out, we had a conference in Seattle. And I had worked with Dennis, a former EVP at Yesu. And uh, 
It was all very cloak and dagger. Uh, Dennis flew up to Seattle with one of his tech people. Dennis did not stay in the hotel with the, uh, the DCC was held at, but his tech guy did. His tech guy put out our two fusion radios, the FT-1 and the FTM-400. At the end of the first day, at 4 o'clock when the, when the uh, uh, conference would normally end on Fridays, Steve Bible and 7HPR, our president, said, we have a special treat for you. And out comes Dennis. Nobody's seen Dennis before. Dennis comes out and he does a presentation. You can find it on YouTube. And he introduces both System Fusion and the DR1 repeater. And while he was doing that, the tech guy brings the DR1, the prototype DR1, from underneath the table and puts it on the table. And that was how it was all unfolded at the Digital Communication Conference. So interesting things can happen at the DCC. So that was 2013. We've come a long way since then. We're now technically into the second generation of Fusion. I think we're going to be entering pretty much the third generation of Fusion right now. And the reason that we call it now System Fusion 2 is, is because we made some changes. Now, not changes of what you're seeing here. This is a core concept of Fusion. Basically talks about the different modes. That has stayed the same. That has stayed the same. You have the DN mode, you have the voice wide mode, and then you have the DW mode, which is data wide mode. But the biggest thing is change is what's on this page here. And it comes down to the types of radios we had. So as Mark said, we started out with the FT1, we started D, we started out with the FTM 400D, and then we initially launched the DR1X. Now the concept of Fusion was using C4FM. Now the reason we used C4FM was because there's a, there was a lot that was out there. There was GMSK, there was so variants on there. There was C4FM, which was being used by public safety. There was TDMA or 4FSK. So a lot was going on out there. But nothing could provide that high quality voice that we wanted to do. Because guess what? Each digital voice mode, yes, is going to have its own unique characteristics. We know this, we talk about this. I hear people ask me all the time, hey, you know, can Fusion do this because the other modes do this? No, it, it, it's not. That's not what we're going to go ahead and do. But in this time thing, basically, with the exception of the FTM 400 and the 991 and the HRI 200, we've basically changed the line of radios. So starting out with our handhelds, we have the FT70 and the FT5D. Okay, the FT5D comes a lot from what people have asked for in a radio. They wanted this, they wanted this, they wanted touchscreen, they wanted color and everything like that on there. We're proud at Yezu because the FT5D is one of those radios that we worked hard to, thank you, that we worked hard to and released during COVID. Now, we're gonna get into some of the myths and some of the lies when we talk about the radios here, but we'll continue on here. So the SCU57 and the SCU58, these are the new cables coming out. We'll touch on that in a little bit too. I know that's making everybody happy. The FTM200, the FTM300 are new mobiles. The FTM200 is, for the most part, our entry level mobile. And then also too, the FTM300 is kind of a, for sake of a better term, a mid-tier mobile. It's not really replacing anything per se. The FTM200, you could sort of say, was a replacement for the 100, but not, not really. It has a lot more features than the 100. The FTM400 is still being used. We have the DR2X out there now. We have the IMRS connectivity. If you don't want to use HRI 200 with Wires X, we have Wires X obviously, and then we have the FT991A. And I will tell you, it's kind of interesting um, how many people use the 991A and have used it on six or 10 meters. Okay, it's actually starting to grow. I'll tell you, if you want to have some fun, there is a 10 meter frequency and a six meter frequency, and I don't think I have it in here, unfortunately where people are doing GM or group mo monitoring or group mode and they're beaconing out and it's kind of interesting. Uh, we have a one person I know that lives over in Southern California when he is on 10 meters and um, doing the GM mode, he's actually beaconed all the way to Hawaii. And there's been other people that have been beaconing from Canada all the way down to Mexico and even doing some 10 meter stuff when the band opens up across the pond. So it's, it's kind of interesting on there. So let's go to this fun, fun thing. How many people hate windows? You know why I don't have hair? Because I have to deal with window stuff. So we decided, or as one person told me today in the booth, trying to see if he's here. 
Okay, I don't think so he is. He came up to me. And if it is, I love you, butter, but, buddy, but um, it was just over there. Um, we just wanted to make money by coming out with new cables. That would fall into this category. But um, the SU57 and the SU58 came out, and a lot of people are asking us and saying, why did you need to come out with new cables, come out with the new drivers? So here's my impression of Windows. Okay, and Windows decided to not work with a lot of drivers for some reason, and we were caught in this maelstrom, okay? When we had our cables, the SCU39 and the SCU40 kit, more importantly, the SCU19 and the SCU20 cables, we were kind of that lost kid between the two parents who were fighting, okay? And what happened was is that Windows invalidated a lot of drivers that could be used um, on Windows 10 and 8 and everything like that for use in Windows 11, especially based upon the actual chip in our cable. That was what happened. So now we as Yezu had two options. What do we do? Well, we tried to get additional drivers to work on Windows 11. The chip manufacturer for that said, well, we tried that and Windows said, no, no, I'm not gonna do it. So guess what? No, no, we weren't able to do it. So then the other option is to go with a different chip and yes, that different chip requires us to come out with different cables and so on and so forth. Now I'm pulling up my notes on here because I even still have to learn it a little bit. But what basically is gonna happen is, is that you buy the new cables, they are 100% backwards compatible, drivers are compatible. Does this mean that you need to go out and buy new SCU39 kits and new SCU40 kits or the equivalent? No. If you were gonna stay on Windows 10, you can continue to use those cables, you can continue to use those drivers without any issues. But what's gonna go ahead and happen is, once I can find my notes, I apologize about this. The SCU55 cable replaces the 19. So what we're talking about is, uh, whoop. what we're talking about is on the 57 kit, basically it's gonna be this cable is being replaced in the whole kit. And then the SCU56, which is that cable there, is replacing the SCU20 cable on there. So yes, if you have Windows 11, yes, you are gonna have to go ahead and to make sure it's operational properly, you are gonna have to get these new kits. We didn't wanna do it, we, didn't, we really didn't. Um, it was more of a pain for us to do it because now we have to scramble, make chips and everything like that. We've been working on this for the last three months. Um, we started to receive reports on it. We have had some people that have said, if you know how to manipulate drivers or you know how to work with windows and stuff like that, you can make these um, previous cables, the 39 and the 40 work on Windows 10. Yes, it is. But if you're not versed in windows, if you don't want the headache, you want that, and I hate this term, plug and play, you can go ahead and do it that way. So that is the first part of the kits or the cables. So let's talk about myths, okay? Myth. All right, first myth, fusion is proprietary. Is it a myth? No. What? No. No? So fusion is or is not? Fusion is not proprietary. Fusion is not proprietary. If you would like to see how it's not proprietary, come by the booth. I will go ahead and show you the publication online that will tell you everything you need to do to build your own fusion protocol and not have to reverse engineer it and waste months of your life, okay? Fusion is an open standard, it's an open source. The myth that comes into it is, is that, guess what? If we want to say proprietary technology because of proprietary chips, then yes, all digital modes are proprietary because of a little company called DVSI. Has anybody ever heard of that company? No, if you haven't, guess what? Anytime you use a digital radio, they know about you because that's who you with the money to make digital radio so expensive, okay? DVSI holds the current patent on all vocoder chips, all righty? So whether you buy a fusion radio, whether you buy another little radio that we aren't gonna even talk about um, from another place that we don't wanna talk about, you are buying a radio that has a vocoder chip in it. And because of that, people will say, well, the hardware's proprietary. Well, don't burn down the office of Yezu, burn down the office of DVSI. I will give you their address, okay? They hold the patents on all the chips. So that's where it is. So that's the first myth that fusion is proprietary. 
Okay. The second myth, which I thought was more kind of a, a funny one, is, is that fusion will be phased out. Wrong. Um, no, fusion is not being phased out. The reason we came up with Yezu System Fusion 2, or the second generation is of it, is because of a little thing we called, um, well, DGID is what we know it as now. Previously, it wasn't known as DGID, all righty? It was basically known as DSQ, so it was Digital Signal Squelch. And the problem with DSQ was is that with Digital Signal Squelch, it was the same thing for transmit and receive. So that's what we had to get rid of that. We, we couldn't have that because some people didn't want to transmit. But more importantly, if you remember, if you were of the early adopters, DSQ had a function called break. And what you would do is break is if you didn't know which one of the 20, 128 DSQ codes that you were using, you just used break and it would like transmit on all of them. Well, that's okay, but the issue then comes into play is when we have someone using DSQ on one repeater, and using another repeater on the same frequency with DSQ, if you use break, guess what? You were keying up both repeaters. So that's why we came out with System Fusion 2, and we added some more functionality into it, IMRS, the next generation repeater and everything like that on there. The next myth that people have gone ahead and I've kind of asked, and this one sort of comes out to the lies, and I think what's more funny is what we were releasing today. So no, we did not release an FTM 500. No, we did not release a 992. No, we didn't release a DR3X. No, we're not going to tomorrow. No, that's a myth. That's a myth on there. Let's talk about the legend. Now, what is the legend? Well, why would we call this a legend? So the legend kind of comes into the aspect of where, like I said, where Fusion came from. And it's, it's interesting, it's been a bumpy road, especially overseas. So I've asked this before, and the answer has changed. How many fusion repeaters are allowed in Japan? How many? It's actually changed. So they are starting to allow fusion in Japan. Japan's a little weird and different on their bands on there. They don't have the normal VHF band and UHF band like we have here. They have it a little slightly different, but they do have, we actually do have fusion repeaters that are capable in the UHF. But more so the legend comes into play why WireZex was created though. And this is where the legend comes into play. When fusion hit the market, we knew that repeaters were not going to be readily available. And we knew that there were gonna be people and there still are people that just, digital is the devil. Well, guess what? It's not, okay? It plays well with others, especially Fusion. But what, this is where WireZex was so, 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 so important. So how many people used Wires 2 or remembered with Wires 2? I mean, okay, so what Wires 2 was kind of unique. It was basically like a DTMF dialing system, sort of like what All Star kind of is to a degree today. But you basically took an HRI 100, ah, okay, and you connected it to your repeater, and then you had a DTMF code, oh, and then the DTMF code would allow you to connect to other HRI 100s that could have the same DTMF code, or slightly different, you could connect it into a sister group, which was a series of HRI 100 connected repeaters or nodes. So Fusion came along and we were like, Hey, that's a pretty cool idea. By the way, um, Wires 2 was started in California, in our office. It was actually kind of the brainchild of two of our technicians at the time. So what happened was we said, well, wait a minute, we got wires too. What if we went along and we put digital? Hey, that's a great idea. What if we went and then took digital and analog and mixed it together? That's an even better idea. What are we gonna call it? Wires X. So therefore, we came up with Wires X, but that solved the solution because people didn't have the repeaters, people still wanted to be able to communicate. That's why, if you actually look in the history of Wires X, what we all take for granted right now, you never used to be able to connect an HRI 200 to a repeater. You could not even feed a repeater over the air in digital with the HRI 200. But here's another part of the legend. Everybody said, hey, Yezu, wake up, let's go ahead and make sure that we can put wires X into a repeater. 
and then it was December 24th, 2015, no, 2014 technically, that we went along and a little file snuck out onto the internet. And guess what that file was? A firmware update for the HRI 200 to be able to now go and take and put your HRI 200 to feed a wires X repeater over the air. Now we had linking. Now we had connectivity. Now we had the ability to be able to connect to one another. Whether you're a node in the middle of northern Wisconsin and you want to talk to a repeater down here in Dayton, Ohio, that's connected to Wires X, I could do that now. We could do that now. Then, as we said, and Wires X started to gain more popularity, we said, no, we released a new firmware, which was firmware 1.10, if anybody remembers that, for the DR1X. It says, connect the HRI 200 physically to the repeater. And there was much rejoicing. Then we went along, and how many were here in 2018? What was the big announcement we had in 2018? Anybody remember? What? PDN. PDN. And guess what? PDN was like, whoa. That was pretty cool. And then after I talked about PDN and showed PDN, the computer connected to the handheld, connected to the cables, and we left, and I got bombarded in the hallway. And guess what happened? Yezu, wake up. And this moment of clarity was brought forth where people saying, but I don't want to use another radio to talk to a radio. I want to be able to use that radio. Hmm. But I don't want to talk only in digital. I still want to talk in analog. Hmm. So then 2018, the legend continues that we gave you PDN. But PDN had two options in there, which was PDN and HRI mode, which allowed you to talk to analog stations. The whole interesting part I found out and why I got actually into Fusion, even before I started working for Yezu, was is because Fusion technology right now is the only technology at infrastructure level that can cross-modulate. It is. You can't go and take a P25 repeater and you can't go in on P25 and come out on FM. You can if you connect it to another repeater, but in the repeater itself. Same thing with Wires X technology. Wires X technology and the repeaters can do that. You can go in digital, come out analog, go in digital, come out digital, go in analog, come out analog, all that fun stuff in between. So Wires X did serve that, and that's part of the legend of the technology in play. The lies. The lies. I've seen so many lies. All right. So, first lie we talked about. Fusion is not proprietary. And to be honest with you, if Fusion was proprietary, could we all agree that Yeezus is a pretty big company? We like to think so. Okay. Could we all pretty much agree if someone stole our technology, we would be in court like Motorola was to another company? Yeah. Yeah, we would. So, no, um, it's not. But the lies that come out tend to be a lot of frustration. And I tell everybody, don't get frustrated. It's not worth losing your hair over it. Okay, trust me, it's not. But some of the lies that we've seen over there is, is that Yezu is a closed network. Well, we've, we're not a closed network. We, we, the technology is open, but there is truth to that in that Wires X is a closed network. It is. Because, once again, we saw the potential of Wires X. Now, all of you are highly educated people. No, no. Yourself or someone else that you're referring to? You're, you're, no, you're, you're good. You're good. I say that because would it be Wires X be cool? Like if I had a business and a radio network and I like hooked one of my radios up to a business radio network and now all of a sudden next thing I have this huge business radio network. That's kind of what we were afraid Wires X was going to be. We didn't want Wires X to be turned into a non-amateur network. We didn't want it to be hacked. We didn't want it to be destroyed or ruined or anything like that. As a matter of fact, we're pretty proud to say that Wires X does not go down on a constant basis. Just because you lose the internet connection doesn't mean we were in our server room and our technology in Japan going, <laughs> no, we didn't do that, okay? We didn't unplug it, no. But Wires X is not a server-based technology. That's what Wires X is also pretty cool about, and that's one of the other lies. What happens when you use Wires X is we have to validate you who you are. So what we do is we basically, you turn on your computer and you go, hello Wires X, how are you? And then Wires X goes, hello, how are you? 
I'm doing this because I'm up on the stage. All right, so how are you? Good, hey, can I be on the Wires X network? Yeah, okay, cool, here's what it is. I'm gonna give you everybody that's on Wires X. Now that, yes, is a server, but when you connect to one another, that's why you have to have UDP ports open. So who has never had a problem with UDP ports? Okay, there's a reason though for that, because people have to remember, when you are on Wires X and you connect to a room, you're going to them. You're not passing servers, you're not passing Go, you're not collecting $200, you're going directly to them. Okay, so that's where the lies come into play that Wires X is a server system. No, it's decentralized. Now the other reason I bring that up is because someone else asked a question, they said, well, why does Wires X go down? Okay, technically, technically, we've never been down. Well, technically we were once, but that was not even our fault. That was the internet. That was actually the internet. And all we lost at that point in time was the server for you to say, hey, you are a Wires X device, you can get in. Without going too deep and too technical, what happens is, is that when you connect with your device to Wires X, you send your IP address up and then your node number, which is static, goes to your IP address for that day, which is dynamic. So then that way, when I connect to your node, I know in my router, well, I shouldn't say my router, but my Wires X thing, hey, today node 12345 is actually going to the IP address of this. And that's why if you ever notice, you watch a Wires X screen, it'll flash and it updates because it's updating IP addresses, okay? No. Part of another lie is why I bring it up. No, we don't track you. You're not that important, okay? So, no, we don't track you. We don't record conversations. We don't do nothing. One of the other lies is, is that Yezu controls every node. No, once again, you're not that important, okay? We look at nodes just like we look at repeaters, okay? You have a repeater. I don't care what you do with your repeater. I really don't. Okay, none of us, even in Cyprus, uh, where, where's, where's Mark, where's I, do we care what they do with their repeaters? No, we don't, have a happy. Same thing with your Wires X nodes. Do what you want, because this leads into another lie. The DPID of your radio, we can shut you off. I, d d I know, right. So, yes, we received a call that there was a person who thought that the DPID of your radio, we could, we have a kill switch in our office in California. Like, I don't like you, you're turned off. No, no, lies. DPID is there and exists in the aspect of you to be able to know when a user is on, to block a user from your node, and to be able to, in essence, know or hear that user every single time they talk, regardless of what DGID you're using. That's what DPID is used for. And I guess the final thing, the final lie, I have to laugh at it and everything like that, is no, we are not building, and this is more of a Yezu thing, we are not building a multi-mode radio. No, we are not. Alrighty, um, I have one card. Does anybody else have cards that need to be connected or collected? Raise them up, we'll come through and I'll get some of these questions. All right, so I will look at this card as we get more there. So question one, we kind of kind of did here. What is Yezu doing to resolve the PDN issue with the Windows 11 and the prolific driver? Well, once again, bad blood happened between Windows 11 and prolific drivers. So we went along and we had to unfortunately release the new cable. Like I said, it was a situation not that we were really happy to do. We, don't, we didn't really want to have to do it. Going ahead and just filtering out the ones that have questions versus the ones that just want the free loot. Okay. All right. Free, free loot, loot, there's two youths. All right. All right, oh, these are a lot of good questions. Uh, yes, I do like long walks on the beach, thank you. Room 403, all right. 
So when system PC starts, it always defaults to standard COM port driver, not the prolific driver. Yeah, so this is a common issue that we run into with computers. We can't control computers. We don't know how you have your computer set up. Um, I will tell you this, when you're doing the new drivers, we have released a manual that gives step-by-step -step and pictures Okay, in regards to what needs to be done, whoops, sorry, what needs to be done in order to um, load the drivers correctly. Please, please, please read that manual. I don't care if you've downloaded numerous, numerous, numerous drivers for things. Follow these steps. There is a process. If you do it correctly, everything will work properly mm -hmm. on there. So thank you very much to that question. Okay, good question. Scheduler and Wires X. Um, no, we, we don't have any plans to add any sort of scheduler to Wires X. Um, that's a good question. A lot of people ask us to do that. Um, we took a look at that at one time. There's a couple different ways to implement it. So we really would not be sure um, on, on how to put it up because of basically, what if the node is not online? What if the room is not online? And then it kind of goes into this weird loop. So they've, they've looked at that, they tried it, but at this point in time, there's no plan to add a scheduler. Uh, is there gonna be a WiresX app? No, um, there's not. And the reason being is, is that um, WiresX needs to reside in Windows due to the .NET framework and the way that the system works on there. So in regards to that, it's gonna be Windows-based, no, it's not gonna be Linux, not gonna be iOS, nothing like that on there, there's not going to be. And, and then the other question is, is how do you locate repeaters that use Fusion? You know, that's a, that's a good question and that's one that comes up a lot. And what I, what we've suggested, let's put it that way. And one of the suggestions we have is to, if you're gonna use repeater book, cause I know some people use repeater book and other things like that, make sure that your information on repeater book is valid. But then also too is the other thing that we tell a lot of people too is if you have a DR2X, take advantage of the voice announcement in the DR2X. If you have an HRI 200 connected to your repeater, take advantage of the voice announcement in your DR2X. Or well, you don't even need the DR2X for that. You can do the DR1X with the wire HRI 200 also. And then the final thing is people always ask if I'm using a DGID because I'll just kind of tack on this question. If I'm using a DGID, how can I tell people the standard DGID to use? Well, one of the things that we've talked about in the past, if you have an HRI 200 to do the common thing. So ND, if you put ND on there, we know it's a node, it's low power, it's usually not an outside antenna, it's something for you. And then if you put GW, that usually means it's a high power node or it's got an antenna outside or it's feeding a, a repeater or we're feeding a repeater over the air. And then the other thing is if you are connected directly to a repeater, put RPT. Because that way if I go into Wires X and I'm gonna to connect to you, I'm gonna know if your node is ND, meaning low power, non-outside antenna. If it's GW, meaning it's an outside antenna feeding a repeater, or an RP or RPT, meaning it's feeding a repeater. But people said, well, what if I'm not using Wires X? What if I'm just using IMRS with the LAN card? What can I do? After your repeater's call sign, put the number of the DGID, that's a good default. So for an example, if my repeater was using a default DGID of 99, I'd put N9UPC-99 on there. Uh, uh, so, so the question is, when taking a 3DR from standalone to a PDN, is it best to do a factory reset first? And it, I'm gonna assume that the question means like if you have a 3DR and you're in normal operation mode, you wanna to go to PDN? Uh, no, um, you just just basically um, hold down the buttons whether you're going to PDN or HRI mode. And then from that point there is um, just powered on as normal. If you're going between modes, between PDN and HRI, we do suggest holding it, going back to normal mode and then going to the next mode on there. Oh, this is a really good one. Really? What relationship does um, Yezu System Fusion have with other digital modes? Um, our relationship is whatever you want to connect to. I mean, there are numerous, numerous different links. Um, anybody from Ohio Link here? Anyway, so uh, Ohio Link, I'll just use that because we're in Ohio, but there's numerous ones, numerous state ones that link different digital modes together. 
we really don't care. As a matter of fact, amateur radio, that's kind of a cool thing about us. We don't be like, oh crap, we can't use this mode because someone else is using this mode. We're like, no, we're, <laughs> we're gonna link it and you're gonna like it, okay? So um, really it's, it's, it's open, however people wanna do it. There's been numerous things created. People create links via RF, people create links via network, people create links via hybrid system, like using devices that come in one form in the network and then go out over the air as another one. So really whatever you wanna do. But I'll give you this warning. Be careful on the access to your network, okay? Because how many people have, how many people have, how many people have, how many people have, have heard that on a repeater or a reflector and you're like, oh God, he was a robot. Um, no, but what happened was, is it turns out that you created a link on a link or a loop on a loop. And what happens is, is that it goes out on the network all the way through the other networks and comes back into your network. It goes out on all the networks and come back over and over again. So cross mode away. Hell, sell more radios for us. I mean, my boss would be happy about that. But connect away. But just remember, make sure your connections are closed and tight because it will save you a million, a million, a million hours of frustration. Will there be a replacement for the FTM 400 soon? That's a good question. Nothing on the horizon right now. Um, I guess this would be a good um, point to kind of address this. You know, we're, we're pretty proud, like I said, we, we are pretty proud through COVID. We, we knew that life had to continue on. We knew that a lot of people stopped going outside and coming inside and had to be inside. And what are you doing? You're going down to your shack and you're sitting and you're looking at your radio. And um, I did it myself and I'm like, I need to buy a new radio. Um, and well, I say that a lot. Um, my wife's not here, so I can say that. Um, but what that meant for me was, you know, it's like, well, when is the new radio gonna come out? And life couldn't stop. And that's why we introduced some radios. We did release the five, we did release the 200, we did release the 300. The five, as I kind of wanted to say on there, is, um, is actually a unique combination of what happened. One, we got hosed on components. I can say hosed, because I'm from Wisconsin. So we got hosed on components and what that basically meant was, and a lot of people have heard me say it, and we're seeing it in the world, hey, component manufacturer, I have, I need component A101. Well, that's great, we don't have that anymore. What do you have? We have B202. Well, what's the difference? Nothing, but we're charging you more. And that's what happened. And if you don't believe us, look at the FT817 and FT818, right? How many people thought it was gonna be a brand new design? Okay, it wasn't, you know what it was? It was we needed a new TXCO for the 817, and they didn't have the one we were using. So what do we do? We got a new TXCO, and then the snowball effect happened. Well, guess what? New TXCO gave us an extra watt of power. Hey, extra watt of power meant we needed more battery. Hey, more battery meant we needed a bigger battery. The FCC said, hi, Yezu. You need to type accept that all again, okay? So the component issue is what we kind of ran into with the FT3. We do try to host radios and repair radios for a long period of time. It's just recently we ended support on the 897. So let me know when the 897 was actually end of life. We actually stopped manufacturing back about 2012. So 10 years we supported that radio, okay? And the only reason we stopped even supporting a radio for repair is because we don't have the actual original parts to replace it, okay? We're not gonna run down to Radio Shack and buy a resistor to put in your radio. No, we don't do that, okay? But with that being said, is the FT3, FT5 was the same thing. We were starting to run out of components. So we're not gonna run something out until the end until we have no components. Because if you have an FT3 and it stops working and you want it repaired and we can't repair it because guess what? We decided to build FT3s to the end. Who's gonna be upset? You guys are. So we did the FT5. But guess what the FT5 was a result of? innovations and things that you wanted in the FT3 that we said, hey, we gotta build a new radio because we're using too many new components, so why not do that, okay? So, that's what that one was all about. Oh, this is a good one. Um, what is the difference between WiresX and other third-party C4FM services, i.e. Pi-Star? So, really there's nothing per se, 
And what I mean by that is, is that it uses C4FM as Yaesu System Fusion for the most part. But what the difference gets down to is the operation of the devices. Are we going to build a hotspot device? And our answer pretty much is no, we have no intentions to do that. And the reason we don't is because we want people to be able to put up a node and we want you to be able to talk around your neighborhood, across town, or for great distances. Okay, that's what WiresX was used for. Making a node that only puts out 10 milliwatts or 20 milliwatts is counterintuitive to what WiresX was thought and concept was, which was, hey, we have one node here, everybody can talk on this one node, and we can connect it to this other node here, and everybody can talk on that node, and everybody's talking. Okay, you're gonna need more than 10 milliwatts for that. The thing with PyStar and those other hotspots and devices that come in, and let me clarify this easily, we don't hate hotspots. But hotspots are not a plug and play device, folks. They're not, they take some setup, they take some things that need to be adjusted and everything like that on there. And that's where a lot of times I'll get calls and stuff of people saying, hey, my fusion radio isn't working. What's going on? Well, we're trying to use it with my hotspot. Okay, and then I'll go ahead and saying, well, does it work on a regular repeater? Well, yeah, that works fine, but it doesn't work on this. And I do tend to help them a little bit with setup on there, and then guess what? Things work out on there. So it's, um, it's really not per se much of a difference, but there is those little idiosyncrasies that need to be set up correctly in order to make it work properly. Are you gonna continue the repeater program? Yes, actually the repeater program is active right now. If you go to our website, systemfusion.yezu.com, systemfusion.yezu.com, go at the bottom of the homepage, there's a link, the application's there, it's still 700 bucks or 900 bucks. In the North America market only, I need to go ahead and do that, which includes Puerto Rico. But otherwise than that, um, the UK is out of our realm, our purview, and then Asia, Oceania is out of our realm and purview, so I'm not sure what they're doing on there. What is Yezu's official stance on wires X rooms connected to a Pi Star? Have a happy. Okay. What's the sorry? What Oh, okay. Well, whoever wrote this. Oh wow, okay. This is a left twix, right twix thing. Okay. So what's the status or the stance on a C4 FM frequency? Okay. So, here we go. Everybody seemed to have a C4FM frequency except us, meaning us as in Fusion and Yezu. When we discussed and we talked about it in the office, we went along and we said, okay, we are pretty diverse in the United States for frequencies and usage and all that kind of stuff. And there had been people who had suggested a 147 frequency. There had been people who had suggested 146, uh, I think a couple 144s and stuff like that on there. But what we started to look at was what had happened with other frequencies, like APRS. Yeah, APRS is standard in pretty much North America, but APRS is not the same if you go over to other countries, okay? So what we thought to do is we thought to try to do it right. Some people agree, some people don't. And what we started to do is we said, well, what is this frequency for? It's for digital voice, it's for experimentation, and everything like that. And we looked at what simplex frequencies were available, what was around, and everything like that. Well, right away, 146 area was kind of out. That's, I mean, if you ask someone, say, hey, what's a simplex frequency off the top of your head and you can't say 5.2, the majority of people would say 5.5 or 5.8 or 4.9 or something like that, right? Okay, fine. So then we looked at 147. Well, we were kind of on board with the 147 thing, but then we found out an issue. And that issue's name was California. And, and well, it was, okay. And what we found out was that in California, the 600 kilohertz thing works for some, but not for all. And they have, I think, 1.2, 1 1.6. They got like 1.2, 1.6 megahertz splits on two meters. So some of the 147 stuff that was being suggested was guess what? Inputs to repeaters. Well, that's a real good way to piss off your neighbors, okay? If you really wanna go ahead and start just blast infusion on the input to a repeater. So we said, well, that doesn't work. But then we, then what ended up happening is this discussion kinda of went, it kinda of grew, and we said, well, you know what? Let's ask the masses. And then there were some people in the UK that said, man, it would be great if we had a fusion calling frequency. And some other people also too over abroad that said, hey, we went along to it, but now, 
guess what? There's no 147s in the UK. There's no 147s in Japan. So how can we be totally inclusive without being exclusive and saying, ha ha, you can't use that. And we started to look in one area that kind of worked was 145. Now, when we started to look in there, there are certain frequencies that are channelized, as we kind of call and say it, meaning you can see that, yeah, here's five kilohertz steps, but here's 6.25 and here's 12 and everything like that. Well, the whole point of going digital, that's why a lot of public safety is going digital, is is because one, it's better clear voice, but two, you can fit more frequencies by going narrow because digital is narrow, right? We're running out of frequencies. So when we looked at it, we said, you know, one frequency that kind of works, kind of works all over the world and stuff, was 1455625. So then after some of you came to the office with pitchforks, tar, and feathers, <clears throat> and the reason that I say it that way is because people started to have a fit because people didn't know how to put their radio in 6.25 kilohertz. Okay, how many people program their radio with their computer? You know, you, you, you just enter the frequency. That's all you do, right? It takes it there. If you don't, it's a good experience to know your radio and do, uh, dive into it to see how you change it. And that's where we kind of came up with 1455625. Why? It's a splinter frequency. Well, that's stupid. We don't use that in America. Yeah, we kind of do, okay? How many people have repeaters in their area that have five digits after the decimal? Okay, yeah. If you're in populated areas, I was traveling through and I there was a repeater in the UHF band that was like 444.90625 and I was like, wow. But point of the matter being is, is that that's the one that we used. It's narrow and that's what you want to put on a splinter frequency. But I'll tell you what, it's kind of in that middle of that digital experimentation band and it's something that we as a worldwide fusion community can use. We're not hopping at different frequencies on there. So that's kind of where that whole thing came up on there. So is there anything official? No, there's not. Just like there isn't anything for, contrary to what people say, for the other digital modes or anything like that on there. Um, uh, two more questions on this is pretty good. What is the difference between Fusion and Fusion 2? Fusion 2 was the introduction of DGID and allowed for the IMRS networking, which we showed up there on the repeater. And then finally, can you sell the new SCU cable separate or do those people who already, those already people who own it have to order the whole kit? No, we started to order, we, we unfortunately you're gonna have to buy the new kit. That's the only way that it came because we stopped selling the SCU 19 and 20 on its own. It was only part of the, um, it was only part of that kit. And then as it being part of that kit, what ended up happening in that case is, is that we didn't want to break out the additional cables. And part of that comes into how people use PDN. And let me touch on that real quick. It is considered bad fusion practice if you go in on HRI mode into a mixed mode room and you don't use the audio cables. Because what happens for analog users, and there's analog users still out there, folks, okay? A lot of them, all righty? But what happens if you go into a mixed room and you're only using the new SCU cables and not the audio cables with it, all the analog users, their radio keys up in a dead carrier, and that's it, until you're done talking. So that's why if you are in HRI mode, please, please, please use the audio cables, okay? Please. Even with the SCU kits, it gives you the instructions on how to hook what up for direct versus access point mode. If you want to, you can even go onto the yezu.com website and see in the PDN manual how to connect things up on there. Alrighty, that is it for questions. Now it is time for drawing. All right, we're gonna shuffle these up here a little bit.
Who's the next contestant on The Price is Right? KE8IGL, come on down! Ron, KE5MDF? Looks like MDF. Come on down. And Tom, WB8EJN. You are the next contestant on Hey, I Won Some Cool Stuff from Yezu. There you go, sir. Thank you. Huh? I can't tell if it's like a D, a D or an O. All righty. All righty. Well, everybody, thank you very much for coming. Please stop by the booth if you have any more questions. Um, we appreciate um, you all being Yezu customers. And one last shameless plug, whoop, on there. Please join us on social media on our YouTube channel, Yezu USA Official, on Wednesday nights if we're not tied up on things for new videos, as well as on our social media pages. So thank you. Enjoy Hamcation 2022.